kids who are logged on to YouTube for today's interesting session on hydronephrosis. When it is antenatally detected, how will you manage? At SRCC Children's Hospital, we have all such specialities under one roof taking care of children, including nephrology, urology. We do bone marrow, uh, bone marrow transplant, cardiac surgery, neurosurgery, laparoscopy surgery, and all kinds of surgeries. We, had, we have almost back to normal at 50, 50 to 60% as of now with occupancy as well as surgical work. And in another couple of weeks, I think we should be back to normal. Many of you may have seen SRCC Children's Hospital. If you have not seen, then I will invite you all to visit SRCC Hospital. It is, it is a new structure with a lot of space between the beds, even in a general ward. So there is automatic distancing between the beds. And we, we invite you to visit SRCC Children's Hospital. With this, I will like to introduce our uh, moderator, Dr. Chandar Lula, and all the panelists. I think all of you probably know Dr. Chandar Lula is one of the senior sonologists in the city of Mumbai with huge experience of perinatology, antenatal ultrasonography, as well as intervention, which is doing for last almost 30 years with maybe about 30,000 cases overall. Our uh, panelist includes Dr. Nakul Kothari, who is passed out from Mumbai, but then he did fellowship in neonatology at Sydney, Australia, and he's back with us as a neonatologist. Next. Then we have Dr. Pooja Vazirani. She practices as an antenatal sonologist, and her area of interest is uh, I mean, everything in uh, uh, antenatal sonography. Uh, and uh, uh, next. And then myself, Dr. Rasiksha, I am a senior full time pediatric surgeon at SRCC Hospital. One of the first one to start laparoscopy surgery or minimal XX surgery in Mumbai, India since 98. Prior to that, I was in US for three years. Next slide, please. Then we have Dr. Rajini Krishnan. She is senior radiologist associated with uh, SRCC Children's Hospital. And she has uh, experience of more than 15 years in major cities of India. Next slide, please. Then Shetal Mehta. She is uh, uh, practicing as a fetal medicine specialist. She has obtained her training with all uh, senior people, including Chandar Lula, as well as she has uh, experience from Canada of a couple of years. And she also does a lot of intervention in uh, fetus. Then we have Dr. Shilpa Agarwal. She is a gynecologist and uh, interested in perinatology. And she is also associated with us at uh, uh, SRCC Children's Hospital. And then we have Dr. Shruti Bajaj. Her uh, area of interest is genesis. And she is uh, uh, also managing uh, Pahel. And uh, uh, next slide, please. And I think all of you know Dr. Uma Ali. She is one of the senior pediatric nephrologists in the city of Mumbai, as well as uh, the western part of the India, and maybe probably the India. She is also associated with us. Next slide. Okay. So with this, these are all our panelists, and uh, Dr. Sonu Udani probably will help us with even uh, moderating. If you have any questions on YouTube, please write on chat box of YouTube, and we will pass on to the moderator and the panelists to answer the query. And today's session is on hydronephrosis, and it is to be moderated by Dr. Chandar Lula, and I request Dr. Chandar Lula to take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rasik. Uh, uh, the, I thank uh, the SRCC Hospital. I think it is one of the most unique uh, multi-speciality pediatric uh, hospitals, one of its kinds. And uh, it has so many people involved in various aspects of fetal medicine, pe uh, pediatrics, etc. 
the aim of this webinar is uh, we do all of us deal with a lot of urinary tract abnormalities and there's at times a lot of confusion on how to manage these pregnancies and how to counsel. So we decided to have a multi-speciality opinion uh, with all, this, all the uh, parties concerned, the nephrologist, the urologist, a pediatric urologist, a geneticist, and all of us, fetal medicine and obstetricians. So the aim is to establish uniform terminology so all of us speak the same language uh, and understand about genetics in urology. We never thought that genetics was a, would play a major part in antenatal uh, hydronephrosis. Uh, we need to prognosticate these babies, uh, whether this is physiological distension, which is one of the most common causes of antenatal hydronephrosis that we see, versus significant pathology, so that the appropriate uh, people can manage these pregnancies, evaluate antenatal uh, management protocols and postnatal management protocols, and then always look at long-term follow-up and outcomes so that everybody knows that what's going to be the final outcome with the nephrologist and what is the long-term outcome of these babies. Now, just to begin with, we start seeing the kidneys at about 10 to 12 weeks, and they usually appear uh, small and bright. As you can see here, you can see the central calysis as dark, but at an early stage, we may not see the corticomedullary differentiation. The bladder is always highlighted by the presence of the iliac arteries on either side. And then Closer to 16 weeks, we start seeing the cortex and the, uh, as a white gray, gray area, the medulla as a black area, and the central collecting system is highlighted by the presence of little fluid usually. So the kidneys are also bright at this stage. And then uh, you also see the bladder uh, distended. The uh, kidneys and bladder are responsible for the amniotic fluid after 4, 15, 16 weeks. And uh, you can evaluate not only the kidneys, the bladder, the perineum, as you can see here, uh, the anal canal, and of course, the renal arteries uh, on either side are also well seen so that you can see the uh, physiological effect on the kidneys. So this uh, involves a complete evaluation of the uh, renal tract. Now, as you know, that fetal renal disorders uh, form about 20 to 30 percent of congenital anomalies detected prenatally and almost three to six per life. Uh, thousand live births. And really the most common abnormality is actually the uh, pelvic uteric junction obstruction, about 30%. If you have a major structural defect, then the mortality can be as high as 60%. But if it's uh, only urinary tract dilatation you're dealing with, then the mortality can be low as, uh, as low as 13%. So uh, the outcome in the surviving infant is generally good uh, if it is a mild disease or a moderate disease with impend renal function seen in about 5% of cases. Uh, but uh, at the other extreme, if it is severe disease, then you can see that the, of the babies uh, have going for renal transplant, almost 41% uh, do have a, a CACU, that is a congenitally uh, uh, detected anomaly of the kidney urinary tract. So prenatal diagnosis will have advantages because we do, uh, we can recognize and treat some critical obstructions, monitor these pregnancies, deliver at an appropriate time at good centers, so, so as to avoid further renal damage and loss of renal function. And as you can see, that 60% of children having surgery for urinary tract problems in the first five years of life are now identified by prenatal ultrasound. So prenatal ultrasound is very, very important. So before we embark on the journey of looking at uh, various uh, pathologies, I, I would uh, request Dr. Shruti Bajaj to tell us about the genetics of antenatal hydronephrosis and antenatal urinary tract obstruction. Shruti, are you on? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, as sir rightly pointed out in the previous slides, uh, the burden of the whole spectrum of CACUT is taken as together. It's almost one person of all live births. Uh, the whole angle of genetics to CACUT becomes even more relevant when you dig into and see the familial data. 10 to 50 percent of children with CACUT have some family history of kidney abnormality. And uh, screening can actually demonstrate renal, renal abnormalities in 25 percent of even the asymptomatic first degree members. And although the syndromic uh, kidney abnormalities often get picked up as a red flag for genomic or genetic errors, it is the non-familial, non-syndromic burden which really needs to be investigated for probability of genetic etiology. So the first 
point which I would want to highlight is that kidney abnormalities, which are isolated as well as syndromic, can have an underlying genetic etiology. And before I dig into what I think it's important we understand why do we need to even bother about genetics and renal disorder. Like most other cases, first and foremost, giving us the etiology helps us to understand what exactly are we dealing with. Most of these terminologies are just symptoms, VUR, chironephrosis, and each symptom can have multiple causes. So once we get to the etiology, we can then counsel the family about uh, the depth and the spectrum of the disease, what are the other extra renal expected manifestations, and that will help us to prognosticate and previous slide, please, and even decide on the candidacy of the surgery. Uh, other, previous slide, please, yeah. And uh, of course, other than that, it is the impact on the rest of the family members, and most importantly, if it is an inherited genetic disorder, whether there is a risk of the same disease happening again, um, and here there is just a uh, one small important point that in case if we cannot investigate the fetus or the child having a syndromic or a suspected genetic cacut, there is an option of DNA banking which can help in reproduction counseling in future. Next slide, please. So this is to very quickly say that the cacut anomalies can be monogenic and polygenic. We are not going to talk about the polygenic over here. The monogenic can be broadly divided as sporadic or inherited. And this, the sporadic inherited and what type of inherited really has an impact on the risk of recurrence. Whereas if I look at the monogenic cacuids from syndromic and non-syndromic angle, that part of the etiological classification helps us to prognosticate and uh, plan a targeted surveillance for the extra renal manifestations. Next slide, please. So this is uh, the tables for these various uh, genetic etiologies of cacuid are very exhaustive. What this slide shows, if you look at the ones which are marked in red, where there are none of the extra renal manifestations with just a renal hypodysplasia in, six two man, in the 6-2 gene or the robo-2 having just a plain VUR, robo-2 having a VUR with even the recessive etiology. So that first point which I wish to highlight through these tables is that even a non-syndromic isolated cathode spectrum can have an underlying genetic etiology. Second point, if we see that only if we take an example of VUR, there are examples where it is isolated. There are examples where it is, for example, on the uh, TNBX on the left, it is associated with the dominant syndromic etiology, whereas on the right, uh, it's a recessive syndromic etiology. So really, we need to take these as symptoms and proceed approaching them, which obviously today's webinar would uh, highlight everyone about or touch upon that. Now, coming to the calute part, which we often just say the luto, you know, lower urinary tract obstruction. But if we look at it as calute, that the congenital anomalies of lower urinary tract, one of them is luto. And of course, there are many more important um, uh, uh, aspects in that, right, from megacystitis to birth defects of the bladder, prone belly, etc. cetera. Uh, in luto, they say just 10% of the luto, even 10% of the luto is associated with common aneuploidies. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are many, many more syndromic etiologies once we start digging further. And uh, a point to highlight over here that just a karyotype or a fish will not pick up these wide range of abnormalities associated. You need different tests right from microarrays to next generation depending on the phenotype. Next slide, that would be the... Um, this is, of course, we're not going to touch upon the uh, detailed flowchart, but it is to show that how megacystitis can be a common denominator for uh, much more than just luto. There can be various syndromic etiologies associated. In fact, in this paper, uh, which went retrospectively and analyzed 541 cases of megacystitis, 33% had an underlying syndromic etiology. And uh, the most common red flag should be a presence of a family history, other sonographic abnormalities, and normal or raised amniotic fluid um, uh, in spite of having the megacystitis. These are the very, very uh, evident red flags to dig further into the genetic aspect. Next slide, please. And this is just to summarize uh, that there are so many genes, so many loci. Next slide, please. If you, which are kind of um, you know, have different uh, phenotypes, right, from hydronephrosis to VUR um, to uh, uh, different renal phenotypes. And we need to understand and appreciate that all of them would have different 
um, uh, enthusiasts, different extra renal manifestations, if at all, and different tests to get over there. And I think with that, sir, uh, we have covered most of the genetics of. Um, okay, so that's very interesting that what we initially used to think uh, that uh, all these conditions uh, do have a low genetic preponderance. Uh, we need to be careful before we talk about treatment and follow up and continuing of pregnancies. And of course, as you can see here, fetuses with multiple problems, you can see a preauricular tag, there are ear abnormalities, micrognathia, club hands, etc., with hydronephrosis. Uh, so uh, this all points to what Shruti said could be a syndrome. This was, of course, uh, acrofacial disost uh, renal disostosis. And so at, at any point of time, before we embark upon talking about fetal urology, we need to uh, uh, see that we are not dealing with a genetic disorder. So that I think is one very strong message. And she also highlighted that if there's normal lycra or a familial history of a renal problem, uh, we need to, but it, I, I, at most times we will always do genetic analysis before we, uh, so Shruti, I think that that's the main message you're trying to pass here. Uh, Dr. Rajni, can you tell us about the various terminologies? We, how do we uh, communicate with our pediatric colleagues and surgeons and uh, other fellow fetal medicine interventionists? Uh, the, what are the standard terminologies that we should be using? Dr. Rajni, first is there? one, yeah, the first one that the common one that we should measure is the anterior posterior renal pelvis diameter. This is taken on an actual scan through the kidneys. And it is measured in uh, millimeters. And at various stages of gestation, there are limits which are considered normal. It should be less than 4 mm, uh, less than 27 weeks. Third trimester, it should be less than 7. And postnatally, it should be less than 10. A rule of thumb maybe is to say that it should be about the same gestation as the months of gestation. It should be less than that. Apart from that, you must also look whether associated with this pelvis di di uh, dilatation diameter, is there also colitial dilatation? If colitial dilatation is there, is it central, the major colitis, or is it extending up to the periphery of the kidney that's the minor colitis? Then associated with this, is the ureter dilated? Is the bladder dilated? How parenchyal appearance? Is the ecogenicity normal? Is there cortical thinning? Are there any perinephric fluid collections? And most important, second trimester on, we must make a note of the amount of lycra. And so obviously, if there is any abnormality that is detected, definitely look for other associated anomalies carefully. Okay, so uh, the very interesting thing uh, Rajni said was that less than four millimeter in second trimester, less than seven is a standard upper limit uh, here of uh, what we consider as within physiological limits. Uh, but you can also have easy ways to remembering it, like she said. So every month of pregnancy, uh, the corresponding millimeter, six months, six millimeters, upper limit of normal, seven months, seven millimeter, or one millimeter per month, or you can also have charts. But what's most important is that there is only one way that you measure it in the transverse axial diameter, and you measure the renal pelvis, look for uh, central or peripheral calicial diameter uh, dilatation, parenchymal thickness is only subjective. You do not need to measure the parenchyma because it has a lot of false positives and false negatives. And you just need to highlight whether normal or abnormal thickness, normal or abnormal parenchyma, ureter is normal or abnormal. You don't need to really measure it. And bladder, normal or abnormal, wall thickness, ureterocele and dilated posterior urethra. And of course, as she said, Lyca, we use the maximum vertical pocket, uh, 5 to 8, and uh, A A AFP after 30 weeks as 5 to 20, anything less than 5 is uh, uh, oligohydramnus, which is very uh, common in these pathologies. So Rajni, again, how would you uh, further evaluate? Is there a checklist you follow or uh, uh, you just scan and everything? I mean, can you tell us the checklist? Dr. Rajni? Hello? Yeah, are you there? Yeah. Um, Dr. Chandra, as you had mentioned in the very first slide, yeah. in every antenatal scan beyond the age of 12 weeks, first of all, we must be able to evaluate both the kidneys, whether both the kidneys are there in position or no. If they're not in position, is it a single kidney? Is the other kidney somewhere else in the peritoneal space? Then after you've seen both the kidneys, 
look for the uh, size look for the this uh, urinary bladder the urinary bladder should be seen after 15 weeks and over the course of the scan usually you should be able to seeing it see it emptying out apart from this once you've seen the kidneys you look specifically pelvis as was mentioned prior you measure the ap rpds then you see whether there is uh, calicial dilatation see whether this pelvis is unilateral or is it bilateral are the ureters dilated if the ureters are dilated how is the bladder is the bladder wall thickened bladder smooth is it emptying can you see the posterior urethra how is the anti abdominal wall if you can see the perineum can you evaluate the perineum properly after the second trimester specific make a specific note of the liquor specifically each pocket and if you have a suspicion of a renal anomaly look specifically again i'm repeating myself for any other anomalies okay so that is the checklist and then of course uh, uh, you could quickly take us through what are the common uh, etiologies of urinary tract dilatation as well so well uh, highlighted by guyan et al at in 2010 so okay uh, a lot of it is usually just trance yeah, yeah. Hello? Go, go ahead go ahead yeah um a lot of it in a lot of the babies in approximately 50 to 70% of the fetuses it is just a transient physiological dilatation in about 10 to 30% you actually have a pelvic urethric junction obstruction now uh, sometimes there may be psycho urinary urethric reflux which is again seen in about 10 to 40% of the cases these are the two commoner causes of the urinary tract dilatation and hydronephrosis that we get to see sometimes there can be mega ureter which could be either due to reflux or it could be congenital sometimes you may have multicystic dysplastic kidneys now this may again be unilateral or bilateral then you can see pu valves these are classically seen with dilated bladders and dil hydronephrosis with hydro ureter sometimes you can see urethroceles you can see ectopic ureters like the way you get uh, Urethroceles are commoner in female fetuses somehow, and another association that you must keep in mind is syndromic associations like prone belly or MMIHS. Okay, so most common cause of dilatation, as we see here, is really physiological. So, uh, Rajni, how do you differentiate physiological from uh, any obstructive pathology? Really, uh, oh. measure the sizes of the anterior posterior diameters, follow it up. Okay. And ask for postnatal evaluation after a thorough evaluation of the fetus. Okay, so these are some of the causes uh, here. You can see bilateral renal pelvic dilatation with normal bladder, suggesting that with no urethric dilatation, <laughs> suggesting that this is uh, probably a pelvic urethric junction if it is more than ten millimeters. And of course, there is a single umbilical artery, which is not too uh, uncommonly seen with uh, uh, these pathologies. This is grades of reflux, grade one to grade five. Uh, this is a dilated ureter, which is actually going from one side to the other side uh, and going and inserting ectopically on the other side. And then these are some urethral seals you can see with uh, dilatation. So some various causes of unilateral obstruction. Uh, this is a duplex moiety with. Uh, Uh, where you can have an obstructed upper moiety with a dilated refluxing lower moiety so various combinations uh, so can you please describe the findings here rajni again here this is uh, bilateral hydronephrosis now uh, this is a 18 weeks gestation and uh, as a seen from the first slide there is quite obviously renal pelvic dilatation and it is 9 mm on the right and 10 mm on the left this is definitely abnormal for 18 weeks i would grade this as severe hydronephrosis with calicial dilatation apart from that uh, there is this large cystic structure that is seen anteriorly that probably represents the dilated urinary bladder yeah and there's another smaller uh, loosened cystic area seen on the right side of the bladder that could possibly be the dilated ureter on the last scan this is a coronal section in which we can see the dilated posterior urethra this is called the classical keyhole sign and so, in the middle section again this is a coronal view showing the long axis view of the kidneys with beautiful illustration of the dilated calicial system and the dilated renal pelvis 
So quite significant. Again, on the second slide, we never yeah. take the measurements. Yeah. yeah. So significant Sig dilatation is seen here, 10 millimeter, slightly bright kidneys, posterior atrial valves. So Dr. Sheetal, when, uh, when does dilatation of the renal collecting system indicate a serious pathology with potential for renal, uh, renal deterioration? So, so uh, for it to be serious, first of, first of all, it has to be bilateral. Usually any unilateral pathology is not something which would be serious. So when I see a bilateral uh, dilated urinary system, along with that, if I see that the lichen is on the lower side, if there is oligohydramnia, then that definitely indicates that there is some amount of renal compromise that's happening. So uh, that's one of the indicators. Second, uh, if the kidney per se themselves start showing any morphologic changes, that also would be one of the indicators that the pathology is serious, like either the cortex is echogenic or the particular medullary differentiation is lost or we see cysts. So these are uh, uh, indicators which, so here as the uh, chart suggests, the more uh, dilated that the uh, pelvis is in the second and the third trimester, the higher the chances that the disease is going to be carried on postnatally. So in other words, the transient uh, dilatation which occurs in pregnancy due to effect of maternal hormones probably would not have a lot of, uh, the dilatation would not be that severe. The more severe the dilatation, the higher the chance that there'll be a postnatal disease. So anything more than 10 millimeters, you have an 88% uh, chance uh, and second trimester and 15 millimeter uh, uh, will have a higher chance. As you suggested, the more, higher the dilatation, more the chance of it persisting rather than it being a physiological diet. Uh, so Dr. Puja, do we have a new, a new uh, characteristic uh, classification, uh, the UTD classification? Can you uh, take us through that uh, to how do yes, we sir. communicate the classification of renal disorders and that's the article from where it's taken it's actually a pediatric urology journal and it's a multidisciplinary consensus or classification of prenatal and postnatal urinary tract dilatation which has significance for antenatal and postnatal management so yeah this is a wonderful classification and uh, puts us all of us on the same page when we see urinary tract uh, problems so they have classified into antenatal and postnatal uh, uh, classification so Antenatally, it will be known as a UTD, that is urinary tract dilatation antenatal. So it will be A1, A2, A3. So UTD, A1, these are low risk cases where they're classified uh, and divided into uh, between 16 to 27 weeks. The anterior posterior renal pelvic diameter will be between uh, 4 to 7 and not more than 7. Then more than 28 weeks, it is between 7 to 10, not more than 10. And these are the cases we are low risk. Why? Because there's no uh, calicial system dilatation, uh, no parenchymal problems, ureters and bladder are normal, and there's no uh, oligohydramnios. Whereas the other part that is UTD 2 and 3, these are increased risk of postnatal uh, urinary tract dilatation persisting and requiring some of the uh, interventions also. So this is classified again between 16 to 27 weeks, more than 7 millimeter of the anterior posterior renal pelvic diameter or more than 28 weeks with the dilatation of the renal pelvis more than 10 millimeters. These cases can have either of the two, either of the combinations of uh, peripheral or calicial system or central calicial system dilatation, parenchymal problems, appearance or thickness of the parenchyma, ureters, which are, can be abnormal, normal, bladder, abnormal, and lyca, which is on the lesser side. So these are mostly unexplained and that this was the classification given and it's easier for us to report when we say UTD A1. So anyone, if the baby goes to any other person also, it's a clear picture that it was a low risk case and definitely monitoring will be decided as per the classification. So here the images are showing uh, the keyhole sign, the bladder being distended. So all this will be the UTD A and A1, A2 and A3, where the parenchymal thickness you see, which is abnormal, uh, significant dilatation of pervis, renal cysts are seen, thickened stroma, uh, so these are the cases which will be uh, into the um, UTD, UTD A2 and 3. Here also you can in fact see ascites which may be due to a rupture of the uh, bladder wall somewhere because of this tension. So again, bladder is also abnormal in these conditions leading to urinary ascites along with the kidney abnormalities. So even though you don't see the bladder here, uh, you see uh, ascites, ascites. And dilatation that suggests it's a real yeah. problem. <laughs> And that is a serious problem. So then, of course, this has postnatal, uh, and we'll talk about that <coughs> later. Uh, this is the low risk UTD A1, UTD A2. Yeah. How do we monitor? And we'll come to that later uh, once we are through. So uh, going to the next spectrum of disease is the lower urinary tract uh, obstruction. 
and uh, that is what uh, Shruti also mentioned as uh, Luto earlier. And the problems with Luto is very high increased perinatal mortality, almost 40 to 50 percent. And about 30 percent of them land up with uh, renal insufficiency due to enlarged kidneys and uh, chronic renal disease. And then, of course, there is oligohydramnios, pulmonary high. Uh, pulmonary hypoplasia and various structural malformations that can de develop and 60% of all these pa patients will land up with uh, 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 pediatric transplants. Uh, the good thing is now that we can see them in the first trimester also and uh, so Sheetal, this is a 35 year old uh, normal NT bladder of 15 millimeters. Can you take us through the journey for first trimester megacystis? Right. So what we see here, the black colored structure in, right in the fetal abdomen is the dilated urinary bladder. This does not really require measurement, but for all practical purposes in the first trimester, any bladder which measures more than seven millimeters is dilated. This is 15, so that's definitely very dilated. So when, we, when, I, when I see such a finding, obviously it doesn't end there. We need to see for other anomalies, to look at the limbs, the spine, the abdominal wall intactness. As far as megacystis itself is concerned, it is uh, graded into two, uh, 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 divided into two categories, up to 12 millimeters and more than 12 millimeters. So when the bladder in the first trimester has the largest diameter between 7 to 12 millimeters, there's almost a 20% chance that it's going to be associated with trisomies. But if we rule out aneuploidies by an invasive procedure, then majority of them dissolve and have a normal outcome. On the other hand, once the dilatation increases to more than 12 millimeters, even though the relative component of chromosomal abnormalities in this subset is lower, this is a subset which generally tends to have poorer outcome because most of them then progress into an obstructive neuropathy. Yeah. Try to uh, uh, categorize based on just the diameter. Why they are there? Not dichloric like uh, so that was first trimester. Now this is second trimester, Shital. Uh, so this is the Luto triad uh, uh, of Chandra, second trimester. Chandra, yeah. one minute. Can you can you mute mute those who are uh, creating sound? Shankar, Chintan, Galaxy, please mute yourself and don't unmute yourself. It it is creating noise unnecessarily. Thank you. Chandar, please continue. Yeah. So, Shital, uh, the, that was, of course, uh, as you said, if it's less than 12, 90% of them can resolve and 10% are chromosomal. Uh, but if they progress to the second trimester, then that is serious business. Here we are calling it a luto triad. Uh, there's megacystis, keyhole, hydronephrosis. So, of course, this is a differential diagnosis. Uh, you will consider what pathologies would you consider with a keyhole bladder, Shital? So, keyhole bladder is classically really described with posterior urethral valve, uh, especially if it's a male fetus. It's not a very specific sign, but it's seen very commonly in uh, that situation. Uh, other cases of a dilated bladder uh, with an op outlet obstruction could be uh, either a urethral atresia, uh, specifically if you're talking of female fetuses, or a, flu a dilated bladder could itself be a completely different etiology like a prune belly syndrome, which is a non-obstructive cause for dilatation. So, uh, so there's a lot of uh, differential diagnosis. We really can't be a diamond that any dilated bladder in the second trimester is. It could be posterior urethral valves, could be urethral atresia, urethral stenosis, prune belly. So high degree of false positive cases. And of course, they do lead to uh, back pressure changes as we have been speaking about. So that's dilated ureters. Uh, you can see echogenic kidneys with cysts. And something needs to be done, otherwise we're going to lose this pregnancy and uh, we're going to have irreversible renal damage. So Shilpa, uh, what is your antenatal protocol for these uh, pregnancies? When would you terminate? When would you continue the pregnancy? And when would you allow it to be delivered at term? And what is your investigation protocol? Shilpa, yeah. are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. So now with renal anomalies, I think these are some of the anomalies which are actually a late presenters. So apart from few like megacystis and renal urgenesis, so if you have megacystis with, as Dr. Shetal mentioned, that we have megacystis and NT high or umbilical cord cysts, so which will tell us whether the diagnosis is more likely a chromo aneuploidy or it is urethral atresia with umbilical cord cyst. So depending on that, those are the things where we can counsel them and mostly they will opt for termination after an invasive diagnosis. 
And as we know that renal uh, con contribution to the amniotic fluid is after 15, 16 weeks. So usually we will see uh, loss of amniotic fluid or there is no amniotic fluid in renal urgenesis. And usually the, the presentation is late. So the termination is usually only for the cases where we have associated anomalies. We see that, okay, the pelvis is also dilated, but we have other anomalies associated with it. We have soft markers and we have megacystis. So invasive and if chromosomal problem, then termination. If we have irreversible renal failure, so again, that is a late, late diagnosis. We will not be able to see it at our gestational age, which is 20 weeks. So we will uh, not be able to see that. So basically, as I said, it is megacystis and renal urge, bilateral renal urgenesis, which are the more uh, commonly used uh, uh, diagnosis for termination. And uh, for delivery, for, uh, there, is no, there is no criteria as such uh, for the gestational age. So they, we can allow these patients to go up to term and then deliver. So, so we will monitor them, uh, yes. Basically, anything with a soft marker associated like an NT or a, a other soft markers, you would be tempted to do an antenatal counseling, a genetic evaluation, uh, and uh, do a echocardiography and other tests, invasive tests, and terminate if necessary. If they, if, and, uh, and most other cases, if it's a mild pathology, you will allow it to continue uh, because there could be physiological problems. There could be correctable problems. So uh, when you see a uh, low urinary tract obstruction, uh, uh, this I would like to ask even Dr. Rasik, uh, what is his, his expectation? Uh, is, the, is the shape of the bladder, the, the, uh, the morphology of the bladder important from the point of view of uh, uh, what you would advise uh, the, the, the parents to continue? Uh, is, or is it only the kidneys, the lica, etc., as we have been saying? Yeah, so... Hello. Uh, here, here, of course, uh, we are seeing a keyhole with the thickened bladder wall, dilated <clears throat> posterior urethra. So, yeah, so uh, when we say bladder morphology, we have to see basically the LBD, that is longitudinal bladder diameter, and the thickness, the wall thickness, and the appearance of the bladder wall. So when we have a longitudinal bladder diameter above seven, as we said, and in cases of uh, 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 the echogenicity, if it is highly echogenic, and if there is an obstruction below that, then the bladder wall will be thickened. That is usually the criteria is more than two millimeters. So three millimeter and above, we say that the bladder wall is thick. So this will basically, the appearance of bladder will distinguish between an obstructive pathology and a non-obstruction. So if it is an obstruction, the pressure is high. So the bladder wall will become thickened. Whereas if you say a genetic syndromes like Prinbeli, where we see a very thin bladder. So the bladder is dilated, but it is thin. Whereas if it's a pressure blockage there, we see a thick bladder and an echogenic uh, bladder, which is usually more than two millimeter. If Dr. Rasik wants to add something to it. Yeah. So uh, from, uh, from ultrasound point of view, of course, uh, Shilpa said very that if it's a largely distended bladder with a thick wall and a lot of back pressure changes, you can see diverticuli, in fact, forming here. This is urethral agenesis uh, with, again, something like a keyhole with echogenic kidneys. And very well, she said that if you have a thin bladder, which is markedly distended, and as Shruti pointed out earlier, if you have normal lica, then we must suspect syndromes like prune belly. But what I, and MMIH syndrome, as this one turned out to be really. Uh, but what I would like to ask Rasik is, uh, when you get information of antenatal luto, uh, how important is the bladder morphology from your point of view, from surgical correction? Uh, are these reversible changes or they are not reversible changes? Uh, if the bladder is thick wall, I mean, it, it has created the changes. And postnatally, even after surgical correction of the primary problem, whether it is posturoretral wall, or uh, urethral stenosis, it, it can have its own problem. Uh, many of them will, uh, uh, if the pressure remains high, they may have uh, either mega ureter associated with it, and it will take long time to subside. Some of them, this kid will uh, either go into myogenic failure, means the bladder muscles will not contract adequately, or in some, it will hyper contract and some of them may end up even in augmentation cystoplasty in later on, uh, later life. So bladder morphology is very important. I mean, if it is relatively not very thick, the prognosis will be very good and we don't need to worry about that. 
Okay, yeah. so that means uh, the message we are getting is that if at all uh, we need to do something, we should do it before uh, irreversible bladder changes are there. And if you have such bad bladders, then you're talking of two surgeries, probably a renal transplant and uh, uh, a reconstruction of the bladder. Is that correct? I mean, are we... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So here, of course, you have seen the whole spectrum. Uh, and this, of course, is a, a, a rare situation of an ectopic uh, ureter going below the, uh, this is a keyhole and you can see that the ureter is going way below. This is tomographic in, uh, ultrasound imaging and you can see that the ureter is actually inserting into the posterior urethra, which is seen well in this particular sequence of images. So imaging today is, is good, but we're not always good. I mean, there is a lot of uh, overlap in uh, dilatation of bladder and in about 10 to 20% of cases, the actual diagnosis of what is the cause of obstruction may not be seen uh, on, on antenatal ultrasound. And of course, if you see a very irregular bladder with a lot of morphological changes, as you can see here, CNS and other, then you could also be dealing with a cloacal malformation. Uh, now, the optimal management of fetuses luto continues to be one of the most challenging subjects uh, in the field of fetal interventions and therapy because uh, there are so many things you can do and uh, what exactly are the outcomes. So, Pooja, can you tell us what would be the further management of antenatally detected luto? Pooja, are you there? Sorry, I was muted. So antenatally detected luto can be either from the right from the first trimester, that is from 12 weeks. So the earlier the onset of luto, the bad is the prognosis that was also highlighted with the bladder side longitudinal diameter of more than 12 mm. So in those cases, like a mega cyst is right at 12, 11 to 14 week scan, we can really counsel the patients and offer them prenatal diagnosis to rule out any genetic uh, association. At the same time, prognosticate uh, at the same time because when we advance the pregnancy, it can be more uh, hazardous to the uh, liker and other uh, complications. That is the first trimester uh, luto, the poor prognosis. Usually the counseling goes towards termination after offering a prenatal genetic diagnosis. As we come to the second trimester uh, scanning, when we diagnose luto in those cases, we need to assess uh, the entire uh, spectrum of the baby, like the, from head to toe, the anatomy. And then once we come to the um, urinary tract and the uh, kidneys, we decide on the bladder volume that is more than 35 centimeter cube is decided to be uh, uh, more significant than the kidney affection, the parenchyma, the appearance of uh, whether renal cysts are there, ecogenicity of the kidneys, ureter, ureteric dilatation, peristalsis to and fro, the uh, bladder wall thickness, whether it's a thin wall bladder or thick wall bladder, whether it's so showing any keyhole sign or not showing any keyhole sign, definitely the sex of the fetus as a fetal medicine or a sonologist, we need to see that for the uh, etiological uh, differentiation between uh, luto, like uh, it'll be more of a urethral atresia, stenosis or uh, MMHIS in a female uh, uh, gender, whether the male fetus is more prone towards posterior urethral valves also, where's other urethral atresia and stenosis? So after assessing entire spectrum, we will decide after the counseling whether the couple at, in the second trimester wants to continue with the pregnancy. If they really want to continue after prognostication, which is very well done in the year, uh, in the article with Ruan et al. in 2000, uh, 2020 in Jan, where they have divided luto into four groups, one, two, three, and four. The luto one is the, are those, those cases where the kidneys appear fine. There is a uretic dilatation, no doubt. There can be hydronephrosis, but the parent comma is normal. The lyca volume is normal at that time. And the appearance of the kidneys are normal. This is uh, low, these are the low risk lutos, that is stage one, where conservative management can be given with monitoring every one or two weeks to see the progression. The two and three luto are those cases where you can see renal parent comma being affected, like ecogenicity coming up, or you can have dysplasia or cyst. And luto two will have less lyco, it will be oligohydramnios, but the urine the, the urine analysis detect that they were favorable. There are various parameters assessing the uh, urine um, in this uh, prenatal cases. And the type 3, they, they show renal changes, they show less lyco as well as unfavorable urinary analysis. The type 4 are the worst prognosis where you can have the blood and urea, means the, the volume of the urine in the bladder after the first uh, analysis is is very very less. The, those are the cases which are the poor 
prognostication and then we can have a word with the parents according to the staging of Pluto. Where do we want to go from here? So the stage one will be conservative. Stage two and three can be offered prenatal uh, correction procedures or palliative procedures like a vesicoamniotic shunting or cystoscopy. So this new classification one, two, three, four is actually a very uh, staged up classification after the study of uh, you know Fontenel et al. and Ruan et al. who have done a lot of work on uh, fetal cystoscopy procedures and vasicoamniotiction. And these this was to lay down the counseling for parents. It becomes easier when you give them the prognostication, like two and three, even if we treat them, they may have postnatal renal problems, which we won't be able to assure them once the renal changes have set in or the bladder changes have set in. As uh, Dr. Rasik said, the bladder may also require some intervention postnatally. The four is very clear. They are the most uh, poor prognostication cases where we can have palliative surgery, uh, palliative uh, management like amnio infusion if they really want to continue. At any time, if the parents decide, they can go for a termination of pregnancy in due course. However, in India, we do have a restriction up to 20, 22 weeks. But actually, in these cases of renal malformation, it's a mostly a progressive thing where we need to uh, you know, really sit and uh, counsel the couple along with a multidisciplinary team that is the urologist, the, the nephrologist, the surgeon, and the neonatal group along with uh, the continuation of Luto. So, Yeah, so uh, the staging is very important. And as you can see here, stage one with a very low risk of either renal disease, uh, no intervention would be required. Stage two, mm -hmm. we could do some antenatal interventions. And stage three, of course, it would uh, you will have to individualize it uh, depending on what the patient is agreeable mm -hmm. with and uh, different uh, classifications. So as I was, as uh, Pooja was talking, I was running through various antenatal prediction models, uh, yeah. which have been uh, coming in from, as she said, from Fontanella in 2017. And the first one here shows basically a predictive model to differentiate luto versus non-luto because really that's really important whether there's, yeah. is it a posterior urethral valve because the prognosis can be bad in urethral agenesis and uh, in uh, other conditions and can be better in posterior urethral valve for antenatal correction. So uh, you can see they have taken five or six criteria and uh, these perform better than the commonly used criteria that is only a dilated bladder and a posterior yeah. valve. So this is one criteria. And of course, it takes into account whether there are other associated abnormalities, like if you see a dilated stomach with a distended bladder, normal amniotic been saying all throughout. So Lyca is very, very important. It is MMIHS. And uh, uh, if there is a genetic cardiac defect, as Shruti said earlier, then you could be dealing with uh, 22Q11 microdeletion. If you have overgrowth syndromes, and again, this is MMIHS, and uh, uh, you have a very high Boring. sensitivity here of almost 80% of a diagnosis and a positive predictive value. So to differentiate why we are talking all about this is because there is a considerable overlap, like I said, about 20% in the various causes of low urinary tract obstruction. And then these are other predictive models which uh, take into account renal echogenicity, the amniotic fluid, as she has just mentioned. And here they are also predicting the uh, glomerular filtration rate less than 60 ml per minute if, if your odds ratio uh, is high. So these are uh, some papers that you can go through. And then, of course, the, the staging, which she just spoke to you about. So the best candidates for treatment would be uh, if you have a, a early first trimester uh, megacystis with normal NT and no umbilical cord cysts and normal genotype. And then, of course, late, if it is uh, uh, in the uh, moderate to severe stage, uh, uh, that is, if you have oligo before 20 weeks and bladder volume more than 54 cc. So as we just said, stage one, stage two is... Uh, so what would you do, uh, Puja? You would do a vesicosynthesis as a triage first to uh, look at the urinary function. And can you tell us more about vesicosynthesis? Before attempting uh, the Vesek amniotic shunt, uh, this was the school of thought uh, before uh, Gratikos came into picture and he spoke about that urine analysis may not help and may create more complications, but definitely this was even discussed in the 2020 paper. So in this, the urine, urine which is 
collected in the bladder has to be assessed. The first sample actually goes for a genetic evaluation. If not done, and they said that they could get 100% results of genetic, um, you know, they by doing a microarray. And after 24 to 48 hours, the next sample has to be collected. And this should show uh, the sodium levels less than 100 milliequivalents per liter, the chloride levels less than 90, the osmolality less than 210, and the uh, uh, beta-2 microbubulin levels less than 2 milligram. This was the latest one. Initially, it was less than 5. And also, uh, they talked about the calcium levels less than 2 uh, millimoles per liter. So if this criteria is attained, then uh, the analysis is on a favorable urine analysis. And if this baby is having like the stage 2 and stage 3 luto, where there is favorable anal uh, analysis of the urine, that is stage 2 luto, has, has got a good chance of uh, you know, uh, coping up with this case uh, if we do a vesicoamniotic shunting. Visa is a cystoscopic procedure, which is now uh, being, uh, you know, more talked about, but uh, still has to, a uh, lot of papers and uh, the learning curve has to come up. So the vesicoamniotic shunt cre basically creates a, a shunting of the uh, urine from the bladder to the amniotic fluid. And in this, what, what are we attend attempting is decompression of the bladder so that we can avoid problems with anhydrobnias and the renal uh, 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 parenchyma is uh, spared from the renal pressure, which is uh, the back pressure, which is coming uh, due to luto. So I think the shunts, you will be able to describe it best though, because I think you've done. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, so we of course uh, started with a great fanfare as uh, everybody knows and the shunts are we, we're doing, but uh, unfortunately we do have a lot of problems with these shunts. So they are easy to place inside uh, uh, what we actually do is load the loading catheter with the shunt, which is a double pigtail uh, catheter. So we straighten it out with a guide, guide wire. It is loaded on into the uh, cannula and then we uh, puncture uh, the fetal bladder here. And then with the trocar, one end of the pigtail is lodged into the bladder and the other end is lodged outside the bladder. But before we do anything, we have to do a therapeutic uh, amnio infusion so that we have to create a, a, a pathway to allow the shun to remain outside the bladder. So although it, it's, it's easy to do and it sounded uh, at that point of time a very logical procedure, we do have a lot of problems. Probably. So that's the shun. Good. Uh, some of our shunts have done very well and we've got, had, we've got babies now uh, at the age of 15 and 16, but they all have renal problems and some of them are going mm -hmm. for renal transplants. So it, it's a good, uh, uh, it was a good procedure and uh, for its time and probably with the advent of fetoscopy and uh, cystoscopy, uh, these may see the end of the day. So Sheetal, I kept repeating that we had a lot of problems. So what, what are the problems with uh, vesico amniotic shunts that we normally see? So one of the commonest problem is shunt migration, where the shunt, shunt does not stay in C2 like it's supposed to. And again, the commonest reason for that is that it's very accessible to the fetus itself. Like the hand, the fetal hand can reach where the shunt comes out in, on the abdomen. So sometimes it's the fetus which just tries to pull out or meddle with the shunt, which causes shunt migration. There could be shunt blockages. Then there are uh, complications associated with the invasive procedure itself, like there could be a high chance of preterm labor, infection, and of course, urinary ascites, uh, because the bladder then starts draining into the abdomen. So, so if we have a successful shunt, uh, are we really doing something good? Uh, can you enlighten us about the Pluto trial and right. why it was not such a great procedure? So Pluto trial was meant to be a randomized control trial where they were had, having two groups of patients, one... Uh, who used a vasic who underwent a vasicoamniotic shunt and the other one which were expected management these were group of patients where the clinician really did not favor one or the other so they were not the worst of prognosis and not the best of prognosis so which is why they were random they wanted uh, they wanted a number reach a number of 150 but they had to call the trial off because they had fewer fewer numbers but whatever little they did they found out that even though the shunt does improve the survival compared to in the group of patients where there was no shunting done however the renal function in those survivors was not markedly improved. So at the end of a month in the group of patients where the survival was almost double compared to the ones where there was no shunt. And at, at the end of two years, that survival advantage still persisted. However, as far as renal function was concerned, the shunt didn't do any good uh, in that uh, regard. So which is why it was, the trial was 
didn't really go through because it had problems recruiting one of the reasons yeah they so said, yeah so there was a poor uh, the, the trial was terminated at about i think 31 30, cases yeah. because there were poor number of cases and probably like you said there were heterogeneity of uh, underlying pathology which led to the trial being t- uh, terminated earlier with, with, with not so good results and of course unsatisfactory preservation of renal function and again here this was the last line was really uh, i felt uh, very very important and that's why i asked rasik about the bladder was it did allow a, uh, a, a shunting of the urine from the bladder but this prevented the bladder from developing well and therefore optimal bladder development was arrested and this uh, really did not help in the improved function of the bladder now we have some new shunts uh, that have come in this is the first trimester luto shunt called the somatex shunt Uh, which is uh, now available and it's a very very tiny shunt uh, very expensive at the moment costs a lack of rupees and uh, can be even used in the first trimester as you can see and uh, uh, it it it's got multiple prongs which hold itself so migration problems are not there and if you can see the premature rupture which can be a problem with shunt placement is down to 8% and uh, shunt dislocation or migration is down to 25% compared to 40% earlier so this looks like a good option i don't think we anybody has tried it in india we've all tried the harrison and the rocket shunt but this is something we can uh, look about so uh, uh, pooja can you tell us more about now fitendo because obviously the shunts are getting migrated not leading to good renal function and the world over as you said uh, fitendo for luto is really the procedure of choice so uh, can you highlight uh, something about antenatal intervention with cystoscopy so again the staging of luto will be implicated in this so stage 2 and stage 3 are uh, candidates for uh, uh fitendo that is fetal endoscopic procedures for uh luto and the basically the 2015 gratacos study was showing that uh, we could not get a consensus on the pluto trial so and because they found a lot of uh, uh renal problems as shetal uh, said despite being uh, despite shunting so fetal cystoscopy procedure was a one shot procedure uh, which they described and they predicted that they don't require urinary analysis in these cases because it causes more complications rather than benefiting uh, the thing they relied more on the ultrasonographic picture of the baby like the kidneys the ureters the the amniotic fluid and the bladder uh, thickness the bladder wall and after that the uh, beta cystoscopy means it's the endoscopic guided procedure through the bladder and seeing the uh, bladder neck if they found a membrane over there they could uh, fulgurate it or do a ablation or a hydroablation or a laser uh, attempt on that if they found the membrane uh, was not present it was a quite a strict uh, kind of a not a membranous uh, obstruction then they left uh, without dilatation of the area but kept a shunt in that place uh, after cystoscopy so uh, urethral atresia or stenosis they kept a shunt and cases of posterior urethral valves were uh, actually uh, helpful by doing cystoscopic fulguration of the uh, uh, membranes which were obstructive however yeah. the the complications uh, or the uh, counseling of the parents is same as you do for any staging where you cannot predict the bladder function or the renal function post natally so that is going to be part of the crux of luto because that we have not the entire uh, uh, study or the research are still searching for you know the ideal candidates for these but however the the in, the advent of this indicates that there is a um, hope for parents who do want to continue and uh, go beyond however there are a lot of learning curve even they said that you may have a pro- procedural problem in the earlier uh, cases but nevertheless uh, because there are skilled people experts everywhere it can be attempted and uh, will be a good line of management vis-a-vis the shunt which is there already there okay so uh, as as is shown me in this flow chart uh, if there is an indication for fetal intervention you would give the choice to the parents whether they opt for a vesico amniotic shunt or a more complicated procedure like cystoscopy obviously you need to have expertise which is very limited and the first stage would be of course to diagnose what is exactly the cause of luto and if it is a posterior urethral valve then you would do a, 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 a fulguration 
uh, and if it is stenosis or atresia, then you don't do fulguration. You will mm. either put in a shunt, as uh, Pooja shared, uh, uh, and uh, uh, or if it's atresia, of course, it's bad news. So, uh, uh, and of course, the important secondary benefit of cystoscopy is you actually come closer to a diagnosis, which is near 100% as compared to ultrasound, which is about 80, 85%. And do, there are some problems, of course, as she highlighted, uh, you could have a, a very thick um, uh, posterior lateral valve and may be difficult to negotiate at times because the curve is very bad and you may be difficult to negotiate the uh, the cystoscope and then you can in about 10 percent of cases you can have uh, urethro uh, urethra cutaneous and a rectal fistula as she just highlighted so uh, what about the two-year results now we are of course in uh, more than two years down the uh, treatment uh, curve and what what do you see as a, in that paper with martinez and sinanias these are some the of the earlier papers. 45 uh, 45 percent uh, in the non-survival group they had a 20% technical failure because of the fistulas and difficult attempt. Uh, whereas in the survival, they had a 55% a survival uh, uh, in, the, in the group. They had 40% good uh, postnatal outcome, but 50%, 15% did show renal failure. That is, even if uh, uh, the non-survival group and the uh, survival group overall 40% uh, uh, postnatal renal failure. Again, uh, you know, this is because of the complex uh, nephro -uro, uh, logical problems, which are complex. And that was the reason there, where the counseling changes, where we cannot predict uh, the cases which are going to improve or not improve. So these are the small gray areas, which is known as a program failure, where uh, despite doing all the attempts, a successful procedure, we won't be able to uh, uh, tell the parents that we'll be successful or not. But definitely the survival was improved and 40% postnatal function, which is which was not seen in the vesicoamniotic case. In fact, they showed a 30 to 40% uh, uh, um, postnatal renal damage despite the shunting. So. Okay, so distinct advantage of almost 55% survival with 40% uh, preservation of function. And that's probably the way to go if you have the expertise. And then uh, there is a relatively new procedure which has just come up on the anvil is the balloon urethroplasty. So uh, this is a very interesting and easy procedure to do. Uh, you don't need a complex cystoscope. All you need is an 18 number spinal needle. You puncture the bladder, pass in a guide wire, and then pass in a two millimeter coronary artery balloon, and you dilate the, uh, uh, the valve or the obstruction. Now, uh, this it sounds very good, and it's got good results and no complications because you don't have complications of EPROM, no fistula formation, but it's successful in only about 50% of the cases uh, because sometimes it can be difficult to cannulate. So let's see how this procedure does, but this is uh, a first initial study of about 10 cases done by Marzina et al., and uh, uh, they have reported uh, it, that it is a very minimally invasive procedure, does not affect the surrounding tissues uh, and allows, the most important thing is preserves bladder functions. So unlike a vesicoamniotic shunt, which is diverting the bladder or a laser, which may cause a fistula, uh, you can preserve bladder function. And even if the fetus or the child goes into renal failure later on, it's possible to use the own bladder of the of the because you're actually allowing the baby to uh, micturate antenatally. So this seems like a good procedure. And as, as you said earlier, comparing all the three procedures, of course, cystoscopy uh, at the moment is, is the best procedure with the normal renal function of about 50 to 73%. And also the survival rate is about 56%. Uh, and but this does seem like a, a good procedure because uh, this, uh, the, you could extend the pregnancy up to about 38 weeks uh, with normal renal function, 40%, very similar to cystoscopy group, mm. group and also uh, uh, less number of uh, complications. So let's see how this procedure performs. So, one, the, so one just uh, yeah. uh, uh, because you've done amniotic shunts, vesica amniotic shunts and all, it is prudent that the baby should be actually in the favorable position. I mean, I, that's the trick. Like it has to be in the, you know, uh, face up position where you can access the bladder or through this. I mean, that's a technical thing which all we all need to, uh, you know, actually it's better, easier said, but it's actually when you go and, you know, scan the baby, if it's spine up, then actually we need to wait for the baby to turn. So uh, really wanted to just have a feedback from you, like how 
uh, do we wait uh, in these cases for the baby to turn because sometimes it's oligohydramnios and hydramnios so what's your experience because yeah it, so it, as i said earlier we normally about... yeah we normally do at the uh, amnio amnio infusion mm-hmm. uh, because you can't do a shunt without doing an amnio infusion uh, it's very very difficult so you as a first stage uh, that is uh, very important to put in a shunt you need to do an amnio infusion and uh, without which you can't so amnio mm-hmm. infusion can have its own complications so you're beginning with a procedure uh, mm-hmm. with a small complication rate so once you are doing a good amnio infusion creating good pockets uh, you have the baby moving around a bit you can also then you know irritate the baby by touching the baby and the baby turns and then once the baby is in a good position you anesthetize the the baby in the mm-hmm. buttock with pancuranium and then the baby uh, less chances but if it just doesn't turn then you know even you can go in from the side and because at the uh, at the at the end of the procedure you really want to put in the shunt even from the side and uh, one end should be out so most important part of putting in a shunt really is the amnio infusion so that mm-hmm. you get a good uh, gap there in that kind of uh, uh, situation so uh, having done all these fancy interventions we have taken the baby down uh, to near term and we are planning a delivery uh, as uh, shilpa said that you can have a normal delivery but of course shilpa with with uh, all these interventions what would you suggest would you uh, consider a cesarean section or a normal delivery uh, if especially if there is an intervention or you would let uh, i mean if, i can understand if there is a shunt uh, you would also allow a normal delivery uh, shilpa are you there yeah 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 sir uh, the vaginal delivery is totally indicated in all such cases okay though the threshold for cesarean will obviously uh, reduce because we have done so much for the baby so we do not want to have any distress at the end so that is why maybe but there is no indication as such for a cesarean there okay so we can uh, go in for a, a normal labor uh, do we have nakul on board at the moment for anti yes sir yeah Yeah, hi, uh, Nakul. So, can you tell us the immediate neonatal management? Of course, uh, uh, we'll have Uma coming in for uh, the nephrology part of it. But can you guide us as to the immediate uh, postnatal management? Yeah. So, the immediate or uh, postnatal management will really depend on how severe was the obstruction was, or was how severe was the hydronephrosis antenatally. So, if uh, you are looking at a very severe, uh, the diameters of around 10 to 15 millimeters or more than that, then you would definitely would want to intervene immediately. But if it's unilateral and uh, the diameters are not more than 10 millimeters, you would ideally want to do the first uh, ultrasound at around day three of life. Uh, that would uh, most of the babies, as we have discussed earlier, 50% of which would uh, be physiological and would. Uh, be transient and would turn out to be normal uh, you would just want to monitor them uh, the diameters at a later stage but if at all the diameters are uh, up to 10 mm or so you would just want to repeat ultrasound at around 6 months of age and see if it is resolving or not in cases of severe hydronephrosis when the diameters are more than 10 mm or there is ureteric dilatation as well uh, the first in, uh, intervention investigation would be the micturating cystourethrography which will tell us if uh, what is the uh, grade of reflux uh, you have shown the degrees and grades of reflux from 1 to 5 so if it if there's no reflux then you would be really worried that where is the obstruction or where is this dilatation coming from so you might end up doing some diuretic renography to look at the uh, renal uh, structures so if there's no obstruction again in that you would not want to intervene and you would just monitor this baby and do uh, serial ultrasounds but if at all there is some obstruction then uh, definitive surgery would be the way forward if at all there is some reflux uh, then you would start with your antibiotic prophylaxis and then uh, the immediate surgery would not would would depend on the degree of reflux most if it is just grade 2 3 reflux and it can be managed with uh, prophylactic antibiotics you would not want to have a neonatal surgery surgery if done later in uh, in infancy would be better then having it in the first few days of life if it all it's a lower urinary tract infection again it would be a definitive surgery done sooner the better so basically uh, you are looking at a 10 mm cut off uh, which yes. uh, we said earlier and if it is more than 10 then your antennas go up and you start monitoring and then you are basically again looking for reflux whatever be the cause of pathology uh, of course if it's a posterior urethral valve etc 
and uh, you look for reflux and then manage it accordingly. And if it is severe, uh, so you would then pass on uh, to uh, postnatal surgery. So when would yeah. you ideally like to do surgery? The common questions that we are asked is uh, when to do MCU, when to do surgery. You know, these are the common antenatal questions that are uh, even postnatally sometimes. So the ch parents are always scared to do micturating cystourethrography. So how do you counsel these parents? <laughs> Counseling is a very case-to-case uh, -case basis. So, in fact, we have to convince them that the cystourethrography, the MCU, will only give you the definitive answer. Ultrasound and everything is just guiding you the way forward. But eventually, you would want an MCU to give you answers if there's, it's in reflux or if it is if there's no reflux, then what is the level of obstruction? So it is a very uh, one of the most important investigation, I would say, for look, when you look at these uh, lutos or lower urinary tract obstruction. Okay. So and, I don't uh, think there's any way bypassing a, this. So if you have a mild, uh, less than 10 millimeter, uh, what do you also see reflux in these situations uh, on follow up? Uh, is there a small a, chance of reflux? Yeah, there, there, there's always a chance of reflux, but then if it is less than 10 millimeters, you would not want to uh, escalate the level of uh, investigations and everything right away. Okay. So as uh, the society, a pediatric society has, uh, has come to a consensus that less than 10 millimeters, we would just want to monitor maybe a repeat ultrasound at uh, three months or six, six months, months of age and then see if it is persistent or the baby is coming up with some urinary tract infections, then you would definitely just ring your bells and you want to investigate further and do your MCO, even if the diameters are low. But if there's no infections, urinary tract infections, and the baby is doing well, you would just monitor uh, uh, with the serial ultrasound. So if there is uh, more than 10, you would straight away ask for an MCO? Yes. MCO before the baby goes home will give you an answer. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, Dr. Rajni, can you tell us, uh, I, uh, are we also in sync with the pediatric ne ne neonatologists? Do we also look at the antenatal, postnatal? Uh, of yeah. course, we have this flow chart here. Can you take us through this? Yeah. Uh, this is in continuation with what Dr. Puja was talking about. Yeah. It's called the urinary tract dilatation unified uh, classification of the dilatation anomalies. Uh, she spoke about the antenatal A1 and A2. Now, these are basically you take the same factors. You see the anterior posterior renal diameter. You see the calicial dilatation, whether it is there, whether it is central, whether it is peripheral. The parenchymal thickness, the parenchymal appearance, these are subjective. Whether the bladder is dilated, whether the ureter is dilated. And according to these presence and absence of these, they are classified as P1, P2, and P3. And to go into further detail about the hydronephrosis, hydronephrosis can be classified from grade zero to grade four. Yeah. yeah. This is the Society of Fetal Urology classification of hydronephrosis. Depending on how much of the fluid is seen distending the pelvis, pelvis or the central calysis or the peripheral calysis with blunting of the fornices, this is an ultrasonographic correlation of what you would see on MCUs. Grading of VUR, similar staging is seen, but this is on ultrasound. Okay, so, so depending on yeah. the uh, presence or absence, you classify them as P1, P2, or P3. Okay, so here uh, this is the same thing uh, as uh, you just highlighted, except that I want to point out that uh, the the uh, MCU is uh, recommended when there is stage three uh, UTD P3. Uh, uh, we would do. Uh, micturating cystoyotrography. Uh, in stage yeah. two, it's at the discretion of the clinician. And of course, uh, stage one, I mean, uh, P P1, uh, you would follow up yes, at sorry. six months as uh, Nakul just said. And this is again, a very similar flow chart combining both the two. So this is from the SFU classification, uh, where one and two, as you said, are milder degrees of calicial dilatation, three and four more dilatation. And uh, Nakul, would you like to go us through this flow chart? Uh, do you use this flow chart or you go just by the uh, 10 millimeter and MCU criteria? Yeah, we uh, do not use this flow chart. So uh, I think the previous flow chart that you, the approach uh, algorithm that you had shown was uh, pretty simple. And no, the previous one. So, just before, yeah. 
yeah so this is what uh, is very easy uh, and a very lucid uh, way to just look at things so we would yeah. usually go by that but uh, it is all comes down to a similar uh, pipeline yeah, so, so actually you can have, see here this is using sfu grade 1 and 2 and yeah. sfu grade 3 and 4 yes, exactly. where you would do the mixed rating system lithography so these are the three grade 3 and grade 4 where you would do the mcu uh, so basically it involves dilatation which is uh, moderate to severe with thinning of parenchyma you have central and peripheral uh, calices which are dilated and this is, of course, uh, showing you postnatally just mild dilatation. Uh, Nakul, I, I want to show you this, that there's only mild dilatation seen here, but look at the grade of reflux. So sometimes things are really misleading. Uh, misleading. Uh, so I guess you would clinically decide which baby needs, uh, because you can see very categorically here uh, that the right kidney is showing uh, uh, normal and left kidney is showing minimal dilatation and here's the left kidney showing severe reflux. And uh, we've also used color Doppler here. The bladder is bad and you can see reflux with color Doppler. And, uh, and that's the, uh, would you like to tell us anything about the isotope scan, the MSA scan? So these scans are useful uh, to look at uh, the renal functions and the parenchymal uh, involvement. So if the baby has a severe hydronephrosis and severe hydroureter, uh, uh, apart from the MCU, which tells us you uh, tells us the uh, the physical, the mechanical problems, uh, you would also want to do these MCU, especially in the babies with deranged renal functions, just to have a prognostic for the prognostication purpose and to look at uh, how well the kidneys are functioning. So you would not. Uh, uh, start with them right away but uh, after if, uh, probably if the renal functions are worsening postnatally or they uh, they go downhill then that is the point when you would uh, actually end up doing these renal uh, functions the dye scans yeah so then i'd request dr umali as a nephrologist uh, because i suppose uh, she would come in at this stage uh, Uma, are you there to uh, yeah, but... guide us through the antenatal expectations counseling? If you want me to go back to any slide, uh, you could tell me uh, any any one of them. No, I think I'll just uh, go through that. Uh, antenatally, I, I think because... Uh, hello, can yeah, you hear yeah. me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, antenatally... Uh, it's a little sporadic that the person sees a pediatric nephrologist, right. you know, because they see the sonologist, they see the neonatologist, the obstetrician, and sometimes the pediatric surgeon. So ours is a little hit and miss when they see antenatally. They come at different times, different sonographies. One important thing I would say is we should not be counseling on the basis of a random sonography which they bring to us. It has to be a proper fetal anomaly scan for somebody has already counseled them on that and they usually come for a second opinion. Okay. So I think most important is are we confident that this sonography that is done is done in the right manner by the right person and a fetal anomaly scan that you can actually opine something on it because we already know there are so many issues. So I would take that as the first step and also when, in what stage of pregnancy they've come to me. That it, it's usually just before the 20th week and they want to know whether they want should terminate or not terminate. Or it is past 20th week and they want to know the prognosis and what can be done. So the spectrum I see is a little different from the spectrum which you all may be seeing. Okay. And uh, the uh, counseling basically I base it on uh, am I seeing an isolated renal problem or am I seeing a renal problem with extra renal issues which are there, either overt or subtle signs which are there, which may indicate a presence of an aneuploidy or some chromosomal issue. So if, uh, if I see in that's common with unilateral anomalies, most often they turn out to be isolated. And so the most important thing I see is what is the opposite kidney like? If the, there's no other, and if the opposite kidney looks good and without, you know, uh, echogenicity increase, particle cells, et cetera, then I usually would reassure them in the sense that whatever is there in that kidney 
can be evaluated postnatally, can be mod monitored during pregnancy, but can be managed postnatally well, either with or without surgery, depending on what it turns out. And we need investigation depending on what we see on postnatal scan. When I say bilateral, I'm a little more cautious because we know that at the time we are seeing, we are seeing at one point of evolution and it may go on to much more. So if I see only X millimeters now, it doesn't mean it'll keep the same grade, it could increase. So there is a, a variation there and that will have an impact on renal function because now both kidneys are involved. Okay? And so here my attention goes to the presence of a bladder problem. You know, how good is a bladder looking? What has been the description of the bladder? Have they noticed bladder emptying well? Thickness and all the things we discussed. If there's not been an obvious bladder problem, I would probably, and the kidneys look normal, I would just counsel them to monitor as long as there's no oligohydramnios and the other things which we already discussed, to monitor clo more closely, antenatally, and then wait and see. The problem arises when you see a bladder problem. Okay? Because as we discussed so extensively, you have a number of issues not a single one of them is very optimistic, but amongst a whole lot, probably P valves, which is the commonest, could still be a little better option from the point of view of future management. And again, the P valves we see postnatal, we are a wide spectrum. Not all of them are bad. The P valves who've done very well, they've had fulguration, they followed up, and long term till we follow in pediatric age group. They're doing well in terms of renal function. But as a broad, about one third of them are likely to go into renal failure at some point in the distant future, if not in the pediatric age group. Those who are likely to go into renal failure in pediatric age group are easy to identify personally. You know, because we have a creatinine which may not normalize after the fulgurine. We have a one-year creatinine value, which is a good marker for future renal function. And we screen them for tubular defects, and we know if they have metabolic acidosis, concentrating defect. Even though the creatinine is normal, they have tubular damage. So besides the structural appearance, which gives us a clue antenatally, postnatally, we have other things which we go by. Uh, so the things which would raise an alarm is always the oligohydramnios and the appearance of the kidney in terms of echogenicity and cortical cysts, which if it is bilateral, definitely tells you that this high likelihood of being dysplastic. But having said that, it's surprising that the specificity of these findings are not that great. You know, even oligohydramnios, which we take so seriously, we see antenatally, the specificity comes to about 60% for bad renal function, though sensitivity is high. And same thing goes for the renal cortical appearance. The specificity is higher, but it's not near 100. That means we're making a mistake in spite of everything because of the technological limitations, even assuming a very good ultrasonologist has seen it. We have certain limitations. So there is a diagnostic, some uncertainty which we have to express to the parents when we counsel that this is most likely going to be like this, but there is this much chance that it may be different. Of course, if we do invasive, we again have issues because it's depending on the timing when we do it. Because there's evolving renal function during gestational period. So the values we see of sodium, uh, osmolality, et cetera, are after 18 weeks roughly. If you happen to do a little earlier, it may look bad, but that may be appropriate for their gestation and we do not have data on that. So Uma, so uh, the, you... we see your PU valves, as I say, multiple factors play a role in the eventual renal outcome, okay? So the antenatal definitely gives a clue that this comes amongst the one third subset with the potential higher risk of going into renal failure. If we've seen oligohydramnios or renal cortical changes, 
they would come into the severe subset with a potential risk of going into renal failure. Now, today, renal failure is manageable. Okay? It's not something you would abandon a child and suggest intervention. What is difficult is uh, tying it up to the socioeconomic situation of the patient, whether they will be able to go through it and offer that. And second, is this child going to have neonatal renal failure? Neonatal renal failure is challenging for everyone, for the parents, for the pediatric nephrologist. It pulls in an enormous amount of uh, labor and care to make it successful. You know, it can be done. So where there would be a neonatal renal failure, sometimes you are not able to predict, you get surprises. And uh, there I would say, you know, probably things don't look very good, but they are again very difficult to predict because things look very bad and then when they are born, it's not so bad. The creatinine is high, but it stabilizes in the first year and the children are growing well. And uh, there was one interesting line in one of the articles that when they spoke to these children with Luto who were born and who were alive and who survived about their quality of life, how the children felt about it, they did not feel uh, give anything negative compared to healthy children. So I think, you know, as physicians, we become judgmental as doctors of who should live and who should not live. But the quality of life those children did not perceive as worthless or not good or why was I born and why am I suffering? They were quite positive about things. So that was a bit of a surprise. So I think a lot of things go uh, before we can uh, take a final decision on this. There are, of course, the absolute ones, which you all have already discussed, where things are so bad that they indicate an early intervention to improve survival. And one thing that is seen is, even as early as 1919, Great Ormond Street, they followed up 98 children with PU valves, and over 50 of them were above 18 years of age. And they have end-stage renal disease of 25%. Today, with all the interventions we have with and without antenatal intervention, our postnatal renal failure in the long term still stands close to 20%. So in spite of all the advancement in surgery, nephrology, fetal intervention, the end-stage renal failure incidence has not changed. And that is because the damage occurs very early. In fetal development, the nephron, the proximal tubules, all are developing very early in the first trimester. So most interventions are happening in second trimester. So the, already because of the obstruct, especially for obstructive uropathies, the damage is already done. So no matter what we correct, and that is why we find that everything improves, survival improves, pulmonary hyperplasia improves, neonatal mortality is better. But renal function you are not affecting because it's too late for renal function. So unless we are able to intervene before 16 weeks, 15 weeks, at that time, to make a difference for the renal function. So I think renal, that there would be renal functional problem has to be known to the parents. But it's not invariable that they will have problems very bad in the neonatal, though so some of them do. So, uh, Uma, uh, it's very encouraging to know that uh, uh, it's ultimately even the children with renal failure do feel uh, good about themselves. And uh, so we should be positive and not doom all these pregnancies. Uh, but the, the other extreme, you also said that 30% of these cases will end up with renal failure and would need some form of permanent treatment uh, later on in life. Is that correct? 30%? One third of all these pregnancies? One third of even those who don't go into renal failure. Uh, it's a very wrong thing that people think that, you know, you've uh, treated the valves and you're okay. Mm -hmm. Fulgurating the valves is the first step in the whole management because you've got to evaluate renal function and bladder function and reflux. These are the three determinants for long-term outcome besides preventing infection. And they evolve. So what we see at a point of time may not be there when they are five years or seven years. So these have to be monitored so that, you know, 
Yeah. So 30% figure. is the figure that we will go home with. And the second thing you also mentioned is the bladder, which you said is very, very important. What is the appearance of the bladder? I think we are going home with that message also that the appearance of the bladder should help us to counsel these pregnancies. And uh, unfortunately, of course, a lot of counseling has to be done at 20 weeks because of PCP NDT. Mm-hmm. And uh, so if you are facing a, a severe posterior urethral valve at 20 weeks with bright kidneys, some few cysts, oligoadrenals, would you ask them to do antenatal intervention or terminate? See, I give them options. No, as I a personal choice. Of- you know, like patients always ask you, suppose you're the mother and you are the baby, what would you I like to do? I, I do decide for them. That's my policy. Okay. I said, I can tell you all the bad things that can happen. I can right. tell you how much could be positive, but the okay. final decision is yours. And is I think there. that's very important. That right. is we find a lead that right. incompatible with survival or requiring multiple interventions, which makes them miserable. But as, I if I may, if I may pin you down further, and if I ask you your gut feeling, you know, I may just pin you down further. Uh, Nineteen weeks, severe oligoadrenals, posterior urethral valve, antenatal, few cysts, bright kidneys. Uh, would you say can do antenatal intervention or terminate? See, I would give them the thing of what we'll achieve with antenatal intervention. Okay. That you will. You may favorably affect neonatal survival, okay. but unlikely that the kidney function would improve. So you would need some permanent treatment later on. Yeah, you would definitely need treatment later on, whichever okay. intervention. Okay, so that's a good because message that. So I think that's a and good the message. Sophie uh, showed a good outcome for renal was because of the choice of patients. They selected oligohydramnios, bad-looking kidneys, but good urine analyte. So they selected patients who had relatively better renal function and they got a better outcome. Whereas the Pluto trial was non-discriminatory. They give the same thing, two arms, one got this, one didn't get. And so there was a mix-up of patients. They were not. So I think selection of the patient for intervention very, very very important. Intervention. But you are uh, positive to, uh, for fetal interventions as preservation of renal function. For the selected group of patients, yes. I would consider. Yeah. Okay, so coming with your vast experience, I know that you have more than 40 years of experience. And I, from time in memoriam, I, you're the only pediatric nephrologist I've been knowing, uh, apart from your teacher, that is Dr. K.P. Mehta. It, it means a lot to us when you say that 30% would uh, land up with renal failure and a lot of them would need uh, postnatal treatment. You would yeah. not counsel them uh, on your own. You would counsel them on factors depending on the antenatal ultrasound. And uh, uh, you would give a positive antenatal intervention uh, to some of these uh, uh, fetuses. So finally, uh, we, uh, we do need permanent corrective treatment. And Rasik, I think uh, you're the captain of the ship at the end, uh, you come in uh, with these babies, uh, which uh, Uma has said needs permanent correction. So can you tell us about uh, uh, surgical involvement? Uh, Rasik, are you there? Yeah, yeah. So this, this so is, these are very similar. Yeah. I must tell you at this stage that if you're planning to do antenatal cystoscopic surgery, uh, what Rasik is going to show us is very similar to what they do postnatally. He's uh, one of the well-known uh, laparoscopic, uh, pediatric laparoscopic surgeons. And what we are seeing or going to see here is very similar to what you would be doing antenatally. So Rasik, if you could take us through these. Yeah. Images. So what you are seeing right now is the posterior urethral valve. There is a membrane. It basically starts from the Veru Montanum at six o'clock. You can see the leaflet, which is going up. And here you can beautifully see that that's that's on the now we are at the 12 o'clock we have hooked that uh, valve and uh, cauterize that so there are two ways you can do that you can do using very fine cystoscope which is six French and through that you put this uh, Bugby electrode and divide it in an older child we can use resectoscope and use the sickle knife to divide that. So here you can see beautiful membrane and this Bugby has little hook. So you can even uh, hook it and then divide it. 
so here you can see it's a quite thin membrane but in sometimes you get even thick membrane even if we can divide at one place which is at 12 o'clock usually it is adequate but we like to divide at 12 and if possible at 5 and 7 at least burn that surface even if we create one big hole in the membrane that is generally adequate particularly if we are using cauterization uh, because there is there is going to be it spreads so what you are cutting actually it is going to be more than that and what we say we want to under fulgurate <clears throat> so that we don't damage the normal urethra and create the stricture in past when we did not have this refined uh, devices smaller scope quite a few patients had uh, 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 stricture at the site of fulguration. Here yeah, it is nicely been divided and uh, post uh, surgery if we do MCU at six weeks it will show good flow of urine with uh, division of valves. The dilatation of posterior urethra will come down. So we like to do VCUG when the patient uh, delivers as early as possible and then take the patient for uh, uh, fulguration. This is a case of, uh, yeah, so uh, I think we will just go through the videos and speak at the same time. This is in case of the unilateral uh, PUJ obstruction. Uh, on the left side, what you are seeing is the colon, which is at uh, running from uh, 7 to 5 o'clock. And what we are doing is the opening up the peritoneal fold uh, lateral to the descending colon. And then we open up the gerotas fascia what you were seeing was the uh, dilated pelvis. What we are doing now is cutting the pelvis. This was AP diameter of three centimeter. So that has been divided. Then we do urethrotomy and do ureteric speculation. Beautifully, you can see that till you reach to the narrow, I mean dilated or normal ureter. And then we start suturing uh, pelvis with the ureter, we start doing posterior layer first, and then you can put either interrupted sutures or continuous suture. Here we had put the continuous suture, but today I like to put the interrupted suture. So you continue or suture the posterior layer first, then put a DJ stand, and then close the, the, the anterior layer, apical few interrupted suture. This is the DJ stand. So typically what we do when the patient has PUJ obstruction or single unilateral obstruction, then we take the, I mean, uh, do DTPA renogram or renal scan, EC renal scan at the age of around six to eight weeks, if it shows obstructive pattern, or if there is a deterioration in function by 10% on follow-up, then this patient will be taken up for the pyeloplasty. If there is no obstruction, mechanical obstruction, then we will we will uh, follow up at the age of around six weeks. I mean six months with the DTPA renogram and take a call. Uh, in case of uh, uh, in case if the patient is symptomatic, then we may do in the newborn period uh, if they have lump, if they have details crisis, or if patient comes with the urinary infection. Some of these patients we have operated at birth. Uh, uh, within first 10, 15 days. Uh, you can go ahead. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a vasicoscopic ureteric reimplant uh, for an obstructive mega ureter. So this child had a, a right-sided obstructive mega ureter. So the way in which we manage is at the age of one year, if the child is around one year, you can do either open Cohen's reimplant, the same surgery we can do it using vasicoscopic ureteric reimplant. If the patient has problem earlier than that, for an example, if patient has uh, uh, ionephrosis or bad urinary infection at the age of one month, we cannot do ureteric reimplant in one month old child. In such a patient, we may end up doing diversion. And if it is mega ureter, I may do end ureterostomy and re-implant the same ureter at the age of around one year. So here what you are seeing is the vasicoscopic ureteric re-implant where the ureter has been mobilized. We have put the catheter on right side as well as on left side now. 
we are creating a sub mucous tunnel so we create that sub mucous tunnel and then through that tunnel we pull the ureter then now we are doing ureteric speculation and then this will be sutured uh, bladder mucosa with the full thickness uh, ureter and end ureter and then uh, at the end i we generally put four or five sutures and put a dj stent and come out so the same surgery which we were doing open today we can you do using vasoscopic or minimal excess surgery by creating three small holes it it uh, it is a very small space and it is challenging surgery particularly to put the ports sometimes it may take even 30 to 40 minutes to put just three ports so uh, it is very good for the patient because you are not dividing the muscles but it's the ergonomically it is very challenging to the surgeon so this is uh, in vuj obstruction or in a vur you can do the same surgery we have already discussed this next slide and mid ureteric obstruction sometimes we take up the patient for pyeloplasty and during surgery we find that the upper ureter is dilated and that is because of the mid ureteric obstruction and uh, that that patient will need uh, excision of that uh, stenotic area as well as along with that ureter ureterostomy apart from this when we were speaking about luto the commonest cause is pu valves but there are other causes like urethral stenosis and i i will like to say that urethral stenosis is not very common but we operated two such patients in last two days one was uh, uh, operated two weeks back we did check scopy and another one we just did it so though urethral stenosis is not common many times they come in crop so we we have seen two patients such patients there are many other causes of uh, bilateral dilatation and that can be because of the neurogenic bladder it can be because of uh, 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 prune belly syndrome and uh, uh, so these are some of the not very common causes but it can occur uh, chandar please take yeah. over okay so uh, important uh, message is that a lot of these surgeries are done now endoscopically with minimally invasion and i hope i suppose the results are much better than uh, what we used to see earlier with open surgery yeah so, so here chandar yeah. i will like to mention one thing when we are using minimal excess surgery there is enormous magnification and the, the we say 15 to 20 times so the precision what we get in laparoscopy or minimal excess surgery is is really has changed the way in which we suture and if i have to say we have not reoperated any one of mine laparoscopic pyeloplasty so far uh, however i have op reoperated two of my open pyeloplasties which were done maybe 15 20 years back and uh, of course both of them were done in a newborn period so uh, the precision what you get in laparoscopy is is uh, it helps you in doing a proper job uh, one of the problems rasik we always fail uh, face uh, when we are doing postnatal evaluation i'm sure all the fetal medicine specialists and radiologists will bear with us is that postnatally we do see dilatation so any message for the uh, radiologists and the fetal medicine is when they are monitoring these babies postnatally uh yeah. so how should we report uh, dilatation we so, should be report as moderate severe hydronephrosis or should we just call the dimensions because it's going to impact their renal functions have improved and uh, you know patients get scared that there is yet seen dilatation so what is your message to them so, so here when as a surgeon when i speak to the relatives probably it is better to counsel them that the dilatation will persist what i am going to do is get rid of the obstruction i am not doing anything for the dilatation now there are two ways the surgeries can be done in one is you excise the adequate pelvis and when we excise the pelvis the diameter epidiameter will go down but many surgeons do not excise the pelvis only excise the puj and do anastomosis and in them the dilatation persists so what we are typically going to see is the epidiameter and on follow up whether the, that ap diameter has decreased or increased of course this has to be coupled with the scan dtpa or ec renal scan and even in that many times the the function may not improve it may even come down in some of the patients 
so here what we are supposed to see is the t half okay, how much time it takes for the radionuclide to go from kidney to ureter if that time is coming down we should be happy and that is what we follow up with the ec renal scan or dtpa renogram and and that is more important than just isolated sonography but on sonography if dilatation ap diameter keeps on increasing that tells me that there may be a problem but dilatation persistent dilatation i am not worried but increasing diameter yes i am worried so basically the baseline diameter is important postnatal post surgery you would advise it at 1 month 3 months or immediately after surgery generally after pyeloplasty i will do either 3 months or 6 months the okay. ec renal scan i will do at 6 months and usually i will like to have both sonography and ec renal scan at 6 months after the surgery and if that is completely clear then i may not repeat it but usually what happens that uh, 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 the clearance of contrast or dtpa renogram i mean dtpa or radionuclide usually it is does not change a lot in some of the patient and then we may repeat after one year and as soon as i see that the t half has decreased significantly i don't call them again for uh, follow up or ec renal scan or sonography unless they have problem okay so those are very very important messages uh, i think we've had a long run so in in conclusion i will uh, say that it's a multi speciality management now that we are dealing with uh, in all antenatal disorders prenatal diagnosis is important as you saw 60% of babies going for surgery uh, urology surgery have antenatal diagnosis it's very important to have standard terminologies we have been talking about it uh, we usually use a lot of algorithmic approach we showed a few of them not possible to show everything uh, but uh, with mega cystis from the first trimester uh, dr uma ali very well said that uh, the nephrons get damaged very early in pregnancy so it may be advisable as we showed with the somatex shunt to do early antenatal shunting even before 16 weeks and then of course you need serial ultrasound uh, uh, with uh, follow up till the third trimester fetal intervention does have its limitations and uh, with time of course hopefully they will improve uh, postnatal imaging protocols uh, are are to be followed as uh, the neonatologist and dr uma said and of course micturating uh, mcu is very very important uh, when you have more than 10 mm dilatation to identify whether there's reflux whether where exactly is the obstruction and postnatal surgery is a definitive corrective therapy so uh, rasik i think uh, we've done a very really good job by covering almost all yeah. aspects i don't know if there are any questions yeah there are few questions uh, i think we will take some of them okay one of the one of the question is what is the cause of increasing incidence of antenatal hydronephrosis okay anyone so i think one thing i would like to add before pooja sheetal and uh, is that we are doing more scans so we are picking up more uh, hydronephrosis uh, the answer actually when i was thinking that the diagnosis is improved okay yeah. uh, would uh, dr uma like to add anything about that as to what no, is the i'm totally in agreement we are finding it because we are looking for it almost everybody goes through a antenatal usg nowadays so we are just picking up more i don't think the incidence is more so okay. the second question is at 18 weeks if there is a antenatal diagnosis of uv i think we have already discussed this uh, uh, dr uma ali discussed so we will skip that what's the difference between apd and tpd chandar um uh, APD is anterior posterior. This is what we uh, measure usually. I'm not sure what TPD is, but uh, anything beyond APD is not the correct way to measure. That much I can say. So you yeah. must measure in the actual scan, as uh, uh, Ranjana also showed. Rajni also showed earlier that you must measure in the actual method and the anterior posterior diameter, and not in the corona in the in the very very early days. I remember 1987 and all people used to measure in the coronal view. That's the actual volume of the pelvis, superior inferior transverse AP etc. And we have now uh, uh, come down to a very simple single measurement. so let's not go beyond any of that single measurement anybody else and knows what is tpd i don't know is it transverse pelvic diameter maybe 
it's probably the same. It's an anterior posterior is a transverse pelvic diameter. I think most of the other questions have been asked, answered during the talk. I'll ask only thing which is not been answered. What percentage of luto are associated with dysplastic kidney? Any any, any guess, Dr. Umali? Uh, no, offhand, I don't know a number really. Maybe Chandar will have a better idea. I but think I did. Yeah, did. You know. yeah, about 60% land up with uh, renal, irreversible renal changes. So you, whether you want to call them dysplastic or irreversible renal failure uh, would be the same. So 50 to 60%. Okay. Okay. Uh... Then if you are going to do antenatal intervention for PUV, then we will have to disclose the sex of the patient to the parents. Uh, uh, see, uh, uh, when we say luto, we are not, uh, we, we usually call it low urinary tract no, obstruction no. because, because we're not very sure really at most times there is a considerable degree of overlap, like I said, and I want to put this message through again that what we sometimes consider as PUV may actually turn out to be urethral atresia or urethral stenosis. So may be not a good idea to call anything PUV. It's better to call it as luto. What what does Sheetal and Pooja? Yeah, it's luto, luto. Sir. That, that yeah. Because what they found a keyhole sign, which was the diagnostic yeah. previous factors for luto, actually they found that the bladder neck can be dilated and can be yeah. because of detrusor problems or a bladder disc. Uh, reflexia uh, postnatally. So the keyhole sign is actually, you know, that was, we, we used to put it as so, keyhole and then write it as PUV. But yeah. now we are coming back to luto and uh, sticking to that till the final diagnosis is uh, made. Yeah. I think so, even, even, even if you know it's a PUV, I don't yeah. know why we should bring up the association with the parents. I mean, we know that PUV is the main features unless we tell the parents that it's unlikely that we could come up. So, we do no, not but, discuss uh, that part of it at all. We can just yeah. treat it as. And, and, no, but, and, but the moment you write PUV, the the uh, the first thing comes hits is the uh, the gender, right? So yes, we, yes. we can move on to the. Uh, but I think yeah. because there's so much of uh, false well, positive and overlap, it's better to say luto because luto. we have seen PUV turning out to be actually urethral atresia. I'd like uh, uh, Rasik and Uma to tell us what exactly are your, uh, you know. When we say PUV, how many of them turn out to be urethral atresia? Oh, I mean, uh, I, as I told you, I saw first two patients of urethral stenosis at this age after 30 years of pediatric surgical practice. So it's not very common. But yes, we do get, which is, I think, less than 5% or 10%. We can't. So uh, what Rasik is actually telling us that it's not very common because there's a lot of them get terminated antenatally and that's I bad news. So. I think so. I think so. Oh, and so I, that's I, really... uh, according to literature, so the, in the false positivity, almost 24% were VUR. As uh, Pooja mentioned, maybe because there's some dilatation which looks mm -hmm. like that. And 20% turned out to be normal postnatally. So that is why the predictability of these signs, we have to be a little careful. So I think 10 to 15% error is possible and therefore consensus by everybody here seems to be that we should not call anything PUV and call it as luto. Okay, right. there are a couple of other questions. Any role of renal cortex shear wave elastography? I have heard for the first time. But, uh, <laughs> no, no, we, yeah, the fault is ours. We do, uh, radiologists, we do a lot of elastography and we uh, kind of... Uh, speak a lot about it so people have started asking this but i don't think there's any role okay is ureteric jet pattern useful postnatally to grade vur oh no uh does rajni want to answer this or you're, you're muted you're muted you have to see how far it is going proximally into the collisional system hmm more than the speed of the jet, you have to see up to what level it goes. And what is the dilatation in the kidney itself? That so decides the yeah. grading. 
So actually, color Doppler we used to think will grade allow us to grade, but it's not very useful to grade reflux. You can see the jet in the uh, in the bladder, so that to rule out obstruction or partial obstruction. But if you're looking for reflux, then contrast is a very good tool. We have yeah. ultrasound contrast where we inject. Uh, we are doing it regularly. Unfortunately, I didn't show any pictures here, but we inject very few like you know, less than 0.2 ml into the bladder and you can see reflux beautifully without doing radiation, without x-rays. Yeah. Uh, is Dr. Sunu Udani around? Our medical director? Can uh, speak to yeah, uh, yeah. Sunu, please concluding remarks. Sunu, we can't hear you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, uh, I think uh, she is. Anyway, uh, what I will like to say that at, at, at the end of this discussion or panel discussion, what we know is all this antenatal. Uh, intervention or uh, planning needs a multi-speciality approach. And at SRCC NH, we have this multi-speciality approach possible. Today, we are running fetal clinic where any detected antenatal anomalies can be evaluated by team of experts and uh, to pass on the correct message to uh, the family and they can take a conscious decision whether to terminate, not to terminate, and postnatally what should be expected. So in case if you have any, any patient who is uh, suspected to have antenatal detection of any anomaly, not only hydronephrosis, but anything else, uh, do, do consider to refer to SRCC NH Children's Hospital for evaluation and further management. Uh, so I thank you all for participating, uh, all the panelists and moderator, and I thank all the participants, uh, uh, delegates who had logged on to YouTube. The maximum number went to 110 or so, and I, I thank even the management of Narayan Health uh, Hospitals to give technical support in organizing this particular event. We are planning to have this panel discussion once in a month on the last Thursday at 7 p.m. So in September, last Thursday at 7 p.m., we'll meet again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you